Well, thank you very much for inviting me to address this colloquium on African Anthropogenic Dark Earths, or what we sometimes call AFDE. I've been working on this uh, issue as an environmental anthropologist, sometimes in collaboration with archaeologists, for a couple of decades, uh, with many collaborators, uh, some of whom you can see here. Um, I'm going to start uh, by going back to ancient Egypt and to the concept of sebach. Um, sebach in Arabic translates as fertilizer, uh, but in English it describes the decomposed mud bricks of archaeological sites. Uh, that is the organic material that is employed as fertilizer and fuel uh, for even from fire, for fires. Um, that derives from the archaeological sites of Pharaonic Egypt. Um, uh, it create, create the Egyptian uh, world and the, the thousands of years of inhabitation created uh, residues that in the 19th century were so rich that people built railway tracks to them, uh, mined them, and sold the soil as fertilizer. Uh, the, the soil was even made into, uh, was used for potassium nitrate production uh, in, uh, as an ingredient of gunpowder. So the idea that past human settlements leave residues that are incredibly fertile and useful uh, is uh, nothing new to the African continent. Indeed, it's nothing new, really, to archaeologists who find uh, the use of these residues um, uh, that are distributed across uh, Egypt now uh, to be a major source of archaeological pollution. And indeed, um, the debate between the current use of archaeological sites as fertile sites and uh, as archaeological sites of uh, cultural heritage is surely a debate that will run and run. Well, my interest in African dark earths uh, derives from my ethnographic anthropological research among farmers in the Republic of Guinea in West Africa. Just a word of context here, uh, this was in the forest savanna transition zone, and here on this slide you can see uh, a, a photograph of a forest growing around a village. Um, and on the right, you can see an old satellite image uh, where the forests stick out as red in the savannas that are blue. And in this region, where people settle, people create forest islands around their village, creating a landscape half full of vegetation, um, uh, rather than uh, half empty. And here, is a uh, old air photograph from the 1950s, top left, of one of those uh, villages and uh, a photograph from the, the ground showing that uh, island of forest around the village. And in this region, uh, ruined sites exist across village territories. In the village where I lived, in fact the two villages where I lived, there were about ten former settlement sites that were known to the villagers uh, and prioritized and targeted for their farming. Uh, and they called these uh, ruined settlement sites uh, Tombondu in the Karanko language or Che Pondo uh, in the Kisi language. Uh, and they were incredibly important for uh, certain forms of farming, which I'm not going to go into here, but the more intensive, um, uh, annually repeated forms of farming, more like gardening than the shifting cultivation, which occurs on much of the rest of the landscape. And here on the bottom right, you can see uh, a soapstone sculpture, uh, which is also called a pondo in Sierra Leone, um, that symbolizes fertility, uh, and, but is dug up in these former settlement sites, uh, suggesting this association between past settlements and fertility in general, but soil fertility 
in particular. Well, inspired by some of the findings uh, that we had from one or two villages, and inspired also by research on African dark earth and terra preta from South America, uh, I joined together with a, a wide group of colleagues to research African dark earths across the forest region of Guinea to begin with. And we found that uh, uh, no matter where you went, the idea that former settlement sites were fertile and important parts of the agricultural landscape was just ubiquitous. It was everywhere, commonplace. And uh, there were just many explanations for it. Uh, these soils were improved uh, because of the rubbish heaps that people had, the waste ash and the charcoal that uh, was deposited around farms and homesteads, uh, the decomposed houses of ancestors whose mud brick houses had uh, gradually disintegrated, uh, the animal manure, people's feces, uh, old iron furnaces and forges, everyday waste charcoal, uh, the, the, the processing of palm nuts, the rice husks, uh, the, the straw of crops, sheep feces, cattle feces, these were all issues, all, all causes of the improved fertility around villages. And uh, people called these soils that they farmed uh, many things, black earths, soil in peace, rotten earth, old rubbish pile, and so on and so forth. Now, this raises a theoretical question. Are these soils uh, that people are targeting created intentionally, or are they inevitable? And with James Fraser, who's going to be speaking in this colloquium, uh, we address this head on in an article. But a good way to answer it uh, actually came from a Karanko farmer uh, who said to me, we are like termites. And I was very puzzled by this expression. We are like termites. But in this region, in the savannas, uh, forest trees grow on termite. So you get a savanna of an open landscape, but there, where there's a termite, you see a forest tree. And indeed, people like to farm old termite mounds, just like they like to farm old ruined settlements. Because termites, like people, make a soil fit for forest and for farming. It's an inevitability of being a termite that you create soils around you in your termite villages or mounds. Settled life in this region uh, is understood then to improve soils and bring forests. That's what the accumulation of settled life does. So these soils exist more as a fact of life and are taken advantage of than as a farming practice. To move on, we expanded our research to include sites in Ghana, Liberia, and Sierra Leone, there in blue on this slide. And uh, dark earths, anthropogenic dark earths, are farmed in all of these locations. And James Fraser is going to be speaking a lot more about this um, later. Uh, here on the right, you have one of his photographs of a Liberian dark earth 1.8 meters deep. This raises a theoretical question, a second. Uh, are African dark earths important everywhere? And quite clearly, more research is going to be needed. But we found indicative evidence that the dark earths are more important for farmers in Guinea and Liberia than they were for farmers in Ghana. And what seemed to be the case was that uh, they are more important for farmers cultivating very poor soils or highly weathered soils, uh, which are typical to Sierra Leone and Liberia, but less so in Ghana. Why is this? Quite possibly uh, it's because of the geological basis of those soils, that the soils in Liberia and uh, Sierra Leone and Guinea, where AFD are very important to farmers, are soils that are on ancient uh, geological formations, sometimes called croton, uh, 
which have not been rejuvenated geologically uh, uh, at all. And so those soils are exceptionally poor in many uh, nutrients uh, and exceptionally poor in, um, in, in other ways. So how widespread is the use uh, of African dark earth in, uh, across the continent? Well, this clearly needs more research. Um, but there is indicative evidence uh, that we've gathered uh, from many locations. Uh, indeed, we used the Archaeological Network of Africa to ask people uh, if they knew where former settlements were used in, in, for farming. And uh, in Ethiopia, a couple of people came back to us, um, Temesgen Berka, uh, who, who describes the owner uh, peoples who refer to ruined or abandoned settlements uh, which are appreciated for their rich soils and are especially used by women for their home garden crops. Uh, Catherine Arthur came back with a similar comment concerning Ethiopia. And here is a photograph from the Mandara Mountains that Nicholas David and Judy Sterner sent to us reporting that farmers cultivate abandoned compounds. Cameroon, Ethiopia, and elsewhere. Um, I'm not going to have time really to uh, address uh, the wider literature, um, but you will have seen in that slide that there is a, uh, a reference uh, to, um, to a review article which we prepared, uh, which brings that evidence. So another theoretical question, uh, are AFDE, African Dark Earths, kind of one thing? Uh, well, probably not. Uh, there are, after all, the Sebakh of Egypt uh, that are the soils of uh, ancient pharaonic uh, cities. There are the soils that are generated through, um, through villages and village life at different times. Uh, but there are also some uh, forms of dark earth that are generated more intentionally and less out of uh, the practice of history. And one technique uh, is the purposeful charring of vegetation in anaerobic conditions uh, under soil, or sometimes called soil burning. Soil burning uh, was drawn to my attention in the work of Roland Porter, who reviewed this technique across uh, the African continent uh, in the 1970s, and these photographs are his. But essentially with soil burning, we're looking at a very different kind of dark earth technology. Here, um, farmers purposefully cut vegetation, let it dry, cover it with the earth, uh, leave uh, small holes in the covering, ignite the vegetation under the earth, and let it burn slowly and anaerobically, uh, and then open up uh, the land uh, that they, or the earth that they have burnt, and cultivate it. So it's a hugely labor-intensive agricultural practice that is used in the Futijanon region of Guinea, used in some parts of the Democratic Republic of Congo, and was observed down in um, uh, areas of Zimbabwe um, in the early uh, colonial days. It's a very controversial technique uh, that was suppressed by colonial agronomists who considered this to be soil vandalism. Uh, but uh, now we can perhaps appreciate it as a practice that produces biochar, uh, anaerobically burnt, um, slow burnt, charred uh, materials uh, being uh, produced on the spot by farmers uh, in, who are having to farm very poor soils. So what I've tried to do today is just explain a little bit about the existence of uh, African anthropogenic dark earths, uh, which have been entirely overlooked during the 20th century and into the 21st. Um, they don't appear on maps, they don't appear on books about soils, um, but they do appear 
uh, as fundamental to the farming repertoire of farmers, at least, in uh, the parts of West Africa that we've studied, in uh, areas of Ethiopia, in parts of Cameroon, and elsewhere. They are, then, extremely important uh, as an indigenous uh, farming uh, practice. And we've been simply trying to reveal the existence of these soils and the significance of them to farmers, and then hopefully to inform current debates concerning the use of biochar in Africa, that is, as it were, the, 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 the mimicking of uh, older techniques that have been uh, producing uh, enriched uh, soils, um, soils that are enriched in char, as well as enriched um, in terms of nutrients. Thank you very much.